The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a woman who is selling some furniture and a man who is making inquiries about it. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Carolyn speaking. Hello, my name is Lincoln Faraday, and I'm ringing to see if you still have the bedroom furniture that you advertised for sale. Yes, there are three items left. Two bedside tables and a dressing table. Oh, good. They're just the items I'm after. Tell me, what's the construction of the bedside tables? I mean, what are they made of? Well, they're a matching pair and they're made of wood. But the wood has been painted. It's not brown anymore. It's been painted cream. I see. Each table has a shelf and two drawers. Oh, and the drawers have square brass handles. Quite modern and quite nice, really. And what about the dimensions? Well, each table is 50 centimetres wide. That's good. Much bigger than that, and they wouldn't fit beside my bed. I live in an apartment where the bedrooms are quite small. What I really need to know is how tall they are. You see, my bed's quite high. 65 centimetres high and 45 centimetres deep. Thanks. Just a couple more questions about the bedside tables. What condition are they in and how much are they? They're in perfect condition. There isn't a mark on them. I had them painted professionally, you know, so the finish is much better than you'd normally expect. As for how much, I think £15 each would be fair, but I'll only sell them as a pair, so that's £30 all up. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, can you tell me about the dressing table? Yes, it matches the other tables in colour and style. Good. How many drawers does it have? Five altogether. Um, the bottom two drawers hold more as they're deep. Hmm. And the dimensions? How wide is it? That's all I need to know. It wouldn't be more than a metre and a half, would it? Well... Just under, actually. It's uh, 1.25 metres across. Does it have a mirror? Three. Sorry? It has three mirrors. You know, a central one and a narrower one on each side. And they're all adjustable. I see. And the overall condition of the dressing table? Well, it has a couple of scratches on the surface, but it's still in good condition, so I'm asking £50. Could I call round and have a look later today? What time were you thinking of? In about half an hour. Oh, yes, that's fine. By the way, my name is Carolyn Klein. It's on the gate at the front of the house. Klein? Is that K-L-I-N-E? That's right. And I live at 19 Domain Road. Did you say the main road? No, Domain. D-O-M-A-I-N. Road. That's just off Ashgrove, isn't it? Yes. See you soon, then. Yes, in about 30 minutes. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a parent educator talking about childhood accidents. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm sure you are all aware that babies, infants, and children are exposed to an enormous number of potentially serious accidents all the time. Accidents where vehicles are involved are always awful, but particularly so when children are injured. Now, of course, most should never happen, but... Unfortunately, the casualty lists increase every year. It still surprises me that so many youngsters fall from shopping carts, for example. With small children, however, the highest proportion of accidents will occur inside the house or in the backyard. Many of the risks are obvious but are often ill-considered, even in well-organized homes. Older children are exposed to a greater number for they are also open to the hazards of the adult world. This should be kept well in mind by parents. Education is vital. There are some very good television shows which do the job quite well, but children should be educated from the moment they learn to crawl, and so I'd say the best teachers are parents, who can instill safety habits in the responsive minds of their children by constant repetition. In this way, they will gradually learn to avoid the danger zones. Of course, if they go to preschool, there will be fewer hazards there, but I'm going to cover a few of the important household areas now. Firstly, kitchen hazards. The family kitchen is actually no place for a child, although children may spend a lot of time there with their mothers. All I can say is never leave saucepans on stoves with their handles jutting out, it's easy for little hands to seize hold of them, and adults can even catch themselves on them, too. Scalding is a serious issue for grown-ups and children alike. If you are transporting dangerous items about the kitchen, always look to see where children are standing. Hot items are naturally high risk. Cooking with an infant at your feet can be very dangerous. Be careful with sharp and heavy objects as well. And not the least of dangers is treading on the child, or their hands or feet at any rate. Let's move on to poisoning now. An amazing number of household items are potentially lethal to babies but are often carelessly left around. Bleach, drain cleaner, and similar items should be kept out of reach of infants who have no idea of their risks. And a word of warning here, never reuse juice bottles as containers for lethal fluids, and never leave these items within access of infants. Playground equipment deserves a mention, too. Even in the most skillfully designed playground, accidents occur. We all enjoy the seesaws, but do make sure that they are evenly balanced. Personally, I don't understand the attraction of the roundabout. It makes me feel sick to my stomach. But the little ones enjoy the ride. Swings are great fun, but children just don't understand the danger of a swing suddenly coming back and striking a standing child. The results are often big bruises or even broken bones. Fractured skulls are the worst playground injuries I've seen, and these are common when young ones fall from a height such as the top of a climbing frame. I think the slides are much safer. Whatever your preference, though, be sure to keep a watchful eye on your children in the playground. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. We are up to bath time now. 
you know that you should never leave a baby alone in a bath because it's possible for babies to drown in a few centimeters of water. But how many of you have been tempted to go and grab the phone when it rings? My advice to you is to let it ring. And remember when you're filling the bath to put cold water in before the hot to prevent severe scalding in case baby climbs in before it's ready. Moving on to electrical dangers, first of all, power points. These have a fascination for toddlers, and they'll shove things into the holes like hairpins, nails, screwdrivers, you name it. Points should always be fitted with protective plugs to prevent this. Teach children to respect all electrical appliances because they are all potential hazards. Do I need to mention cigarettes? Unfortunately, I still see parents smoking in spaces where their children have to inhale the cigarette smoke. We all know the dangers of secondhand smoke. But even leaving a packet of cigarettes within reach is dangerous because eating just one cigarette may poison a small child. If quitting the habit is too difficult, please ensure all tobacco products are kept out of reach and smoke outside. Lastly, given our cold winters, I need to warn you about heating systems. Open fires and heaters must be covered by protective devices. Even radiators and other sources of heat, which are attractive to children, can cause a nasty burn on sensitive young skin. Remember, there is never a good time to leave infants by themselves in a room where there is an unprotected source of heat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear three students discussing the issue of waste deposited in space. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 23. Hey, did you manage to go to the talk by Dr Chadwick this morning, Andy? I was there. What happened to you, Sam? My bike had a puncture. Mm. Seriously. Anyway, Ruth, I bet you took some notes. Can you fill me in? Sure. It was all about space junk. Really interesting, actually. I mean, I knew about how much rubbish humans are dumping here on planet Earth, but I had no idea how much junk there is flying around in space. Did you know that there are literally millions of pieces of rubbish orbiting the Earth as we speak? Not until now, I didn't. <laughs> they reckon that around a 100 tonnes of very small objects, like mainly dust, drops on Earth every single day. Yes, that's what she said. I thought space junk was all man-made. I can't believe they know so accurately how much is actually out there. Do they track and monitor it all the time? Yeah, they do. According to the talk, there are nearly 25,000 objects, larger than 10 centimetres in diameter, now orbiting the Earth. And what does all this space junk consist of? Isn't it all discarded parts of rockets that were either broken or left behind after space missions, like Apollo and all those spacecraft from years ago. Well, yes, but not only that. All other kinds of debris that we've dumped in space too. Anything from dead satellites to loose metal screws. There are even tiny particles of paint and liquid coolant. You now have some time to look at questions 24 to 26. Now listen to the next part of the discussion and answer questions 24 to 26. 
So who is to blame for depositing all this rubbish? Where does it come from? Well, I knew you were going to ask me that, Sam. So hang on, you can take some of my notes if you like. Thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Here, look. Over a third, thirty-seven percent to be exact, comes from Russia, but other countries are close behind. Another third, well, just under actually, twenty-nine percent is from America, and then twenty-eight percent is from China. Yes, but other countries like India are adding to the rubbish pile, and don't forget the European Space Agency also has spacecraft in orbit. That's true. We're talking serious space junk here.、Mm, pretty serious, I'd say. So come on, what do you think are the chances of something solid dropping from space onto our heads? <laughs> Good question. Everyone asks that. Dr. Chadwick said at least one piece of junk falls to Earth every single day. But look at it this way: Earth is a pretty big place, so actually the statistical chances of being hit are extremely low. You now have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the discussion. And answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. So, are you saying I'm more likely to win the lottery? Well, just <laughs> think about it. Two thirds of the Earth is ocean. <laughs> That's true, but in time, almost all these pieces of rubbish will fall to Earth because the object's orbit is decreased by its gravitational pull. But the good news is that they don't cause any serious damage. You know they can't actually survive the heat generated on re-entry. They simply burn away. But that's not always the case. There are exceptions. Chunks of the United States UARS satellite recently fell into the Pacific Ocean. The UARS satellite. It was this six-ton satellite launched by the Space Shuttle Discovery way back in 1991. So it had been up in space for 20 years, but stopped working in 2005. It weighed five thousand seven hundred kilos, and that's about the same as a double-decker bus, apparently. And I just check my notes. Here it is. Yes, the largest of these great big chunks that fell into the sea weighed about a hundred and fifty-eight kilograms. Think of the weight of an adult gorilla, Sam, and you get the picture. A nice soft landing, then. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Chadwick said, "Imagine a couple of washing machines tied together." And travelling at a hundred miles per hour, and you'll get an idea. <laughs> oh, and do you remember Skylab? That was another U.S. space station, and it fell to Earth at least three decades ago in 1979. It fell into the Indian Ocean and the deserts of Western Australia. According to what I wrote down, that particular space junk weighed 100 tons, and let's not forget Mir. The Russian space station, Mir, weighed 135 tons, far, far larger than UARS, and it fell to Earth in 2001. It plunged straight into the South Pacific. All very interesting. Listen, I've got some junk of my own to sort out. My bike. That's the second puncture this week. <laughs> Come on, I'll help you fix it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the Environmental Studies Department on Agriculture and Environment. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this lecture on agriculture and the environment. I hope it is enough to make some of you decide on a career in the field of agricultural science. As you all know, food is a basic human need, and producing enough of it is the single greatest challenge facing the modern world. Developing nations have rapidly expanding populations, so agriculture should be central to any development agenda for those countries. What's more, 75% of people in the developing world are dependent, directly or indirectly, on agriculture for their livelihood. And for many low-income countries, it's the most important sector of the economy, accounting for 50% of GDP and sometimes it's the primary, if not only, source of foreign currency. Now, of course, when I talk about agriculture, I am using the term to encompass more than just growing food crops. Of course, livestock farming, fishing, and forestry are included. In order to combat wide-scale food shortages, agricultural research programs are underway in many areas. Using science is one way to increase productivity. But a word of warning, agriculture must also be sustainable. Let's look at approaches that are not sustainable. Firstly, overgrazing and intensive cropping are two ancient but destructive practices that lead to loss of soil fertility. Secondly, the modern idea of liberal application of chemical pesticides and herbicides has had disastrous consequences for the health of the land, ranging from the pollution of water sources to the destruction of wildlife. These practices have ignored the mechanisms that sustain ecological communities. Ignorance has led to the destruction of the very biodiversity that is essential for sustainable food production. However, introducing new agricultural techniques especially things like genetic engineering, can be difficult because many people remain suspicious of the fact that plants have had their genetic material modified by scientists. Biotechnology has also led to the dubious practice of bioprospecting, or, as some prefer to call it, biopiracy. Foreign multinational companies have been accused of illegally obtaining samples of indigenous plants of other countries in order to get their hands on genetic material to improve the quality or yield of their own crops. We must put aside the controversy surrounding the field of agricultural biotechnology in order to concentrate on the biggest threat to food production on this planet, which is, yes, climate change. The effects of global warming so far have been to shrink the food supply, thereby pushing up prices and making even the most basic necessities unaffordable. As I see it, the international community must address this and other challenges to agricultural production with urgency. Concrete scientific and technological achievements need to be presented for farmers to evaluate and learn to use, but apart from that, Governments need to address the complex issues of policy development if the world's hungry are to be fed. Environmental policies need to be put in place to protect ecosystems and correct soil degradation where possible. Countries cannot continue to exploit natural resources whilst ignoring the consequences. In fact, I'd like to see teams of agriculture and environment experts making up a global network which would monitor the world's farming systems. Different farming systems should be studied not only with a view to analyzing the environmental effects, but the social and economic effects as well. 
The studies would be carried out with a view to stemming pollution and erosion and promoting safe, cost-effective practices that will guarantee a secure food supply in the future. Monitoring sites would need to be set up all across the world and data collected in a systematic way. Of course, building the online infrastructure for such a project would cost millions of dollars, and there would be ongoing costs involved with the monitoring system. But the information gathered would go a long way towards solving the problem of feeding the masses and ensuring millions of people don't face a hungry future. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers